from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus, the Middle East Institute's podcast featuring discussion and analysis on U.S. foreign policy and contemporary political and social issues in the Middle East. My name is Intisar Fakir. I'm a senior fellow and the director of the North Africa and Sahel program at MEI. Today, I'm hosting our episode on Tunisia's political crisis. I am joined by two outstanding journalists, Lilia Blaze and Fadl Ali Reda. Lilia is someone whose work I have followed for a long time. She is a Franco-Tunisian journalist with a long record of excellent reporting for outlets such as France 24, Le Monde, and The New York Times. Fadl is a non-resident fellow with us in the North Africa and Sahel program. He also has a long track record of excellent reporting on Tunisia. He's the founder and editor of Meshkel, a media and analysis outlet dedicated to Tunisian affairs. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. So let me set the scene a bit. About two months ago, Tunisia took a dramatic turn in its political path, nearly 11 years after the revolution of 2011. That is 11 years of political transition, including the writing of a landmark constitution, the emergence of new political actors, new structures, and essentially a political rebirth. The new direction or turn that I'm talking about began on July 25th, when President Qais Saeed sacked the prime minister and suspended the country's legislative branch, arguing that the constitution grants him extraordinary measures to respond to an imminent threat or danger. About two months later, on September 22nd, Qais Saeed then suspended much of the constitution and announced that he will rule by decree, giving himself extensive authority. Shortly after this announcement, he appointed a new prime minister on September 29th, Ms. Najla Boudin Ramdan, who will implement his vision, which remains to be seen. Following that, on October 11th, Qais Saeed then swore in a new government under Ms. Boudin's leadership. I have a sense that Qais Saeed is making things up as he goes, but underlying all of this is his desire to remake the political system. Now, that political system that was in place until this past summer has not been delivering for Tunisians. Parliament was the victim of infighting and ineffectiveness. Government had failed to tackle a range of issues that the country struggles with, most glaringly the latest wave of the COVID-19 infections that devastated Tunisia over the summer. And as suffering grew and the need for an urgent solution increased, Qais Saeed seized on this national context to take extraordinary and unconstitutional measures. Initially, and following the July 25th event, the extent of what he did back then suspending parliament and firing the prime minister could arguably be considered still within the constitutional framework. However, since the rule by decree has taken the country outside of constitutional bounds and Tunisia is now in uncharted territory. And this is what we will be discussing today. So first, let's talk about reactions to what's been happening. Lilia, how are various actors reacting to what Qais Saeed has done? And how would you describe the way that the political and civil society spheres are shaping up in response? I would say there were two different there were two different timing in the reactions. There were the reactions after the 25th of July, where there was sort of consensual enthusiasm towards the first actions of Kay Sayed, mostly because most of political actors outside of the parliament were fed up with the situation. The unions such as the powerful UGTT and also even member of parliament were calling for a change in the political sphere because there was really a deadlock with the parliament and the prime minister at the time, Hichem Mishishi. And there was also the sanitary crisis where Tunisia was really at a low point and people were expecting vaccines, and the popular opinion was really against the the government for not acting fast on the vaccination. So after this general enthusiasm and the call for, you know, a dialogue 
and also trying to, from different political actors and UGTT, they try to talk with Kay Sayed or to encourage maybe a dialogue. After this, there were the measures of the 22nd of September, which were different because Kay Sayed basically implemented his monopoly on the legislative and executive power. And this kind of created a shift. People who were very enthusiastic at first were more cautious afterwards because it's difficult. Until now, it's difficult in Tunisia to assess what kind of shift we are facing. Is it a shift toward authoritarianism? because Kaysay didn't put any deadline to his measures, or is it a shift towards a referendum and elections and a change of regime, and it's only, you know, for a short period of time. And until now, it's very unclear. And I would say that UGTT, for instance, has completely shifted position. They have switched gears. Even if inside the UGTT there is not a global consensus, People are still supporting Kay Sayed. People also from the executive branch of the UGTT are questioning the intentions of the president. And it's the same with other political actors who are more and more calling for a dialogue. I would say, nonetheless, that in the public opinion, Kay Sayed is still very supported. When you see the polls, his popularity is still very high. And people still support what he did. So for now, it's more a matter of wait and see. We have a new government. We need to see how much Kay Sayed will try to discuss or implement his politics with the blessing or at least with while discussing with unions and even uh, the world of enterprises and companies in Tunisia, because now the main criticism is against his lack of communication. Now, th- that's a really good segue, Lilia. Fadl, do you see this sort of shift that Lilia is talking about among some of the powerful political and civil society actors also happening on the street? Or do you see sort of more of the kind of popular approval that she is talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, there's this shift, but there may be maybe an, another shift backwards. So I think there's the 25th and the 22nd, you know, those two big dates are, are, are key to sort of seeing the difference in the shift in different positions among political parties, unions, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's also the appointment of the, the new prime minister on September 29th and the new government on October 11th. And I think from the 22nd onwards, we did see the shift that Lilia was saying, sort of more pressure from the political class towards Kai I mean, at some point, you know, it felt like the entire political class was critical of uh, the president. But with the naming of the, the new government, I feel like some of that has been, uh, maybe some of the strength of that opposition or criticism that we started to see mobilized against the president has been taken out a little bit. They just put out a statement a couple of days ago, and, and the first thing they talked about actually was foreign intervention. It wasn't about um, the president. And so when we're looking at the president and his steps, sometimes foreign discussion or uh, analysis or um, sort of the domestic political situation can have a local effect as well. And in this case, it may be actually um, taking some of the sting of the domestic criticism of the president out. But just, just to, to go back to your question about the, the streets, you know, there was... Initially, widespread support, as uh, Lilia said, you know, this was celebrations uh, against the failing government, you know, one that seemed totally disconnected from the people with a huge failure on COVID, not just on the health policy side, but also on the economic side with some of the punitive measures that didn't really alleviate the health crisis. And so there was support for a, a bold move, not necessarily, you know, in support of President Kai Said himself, but maybe more against parliament that hasn't really been seen as, as maybe democratic or a representative of the people. We've seen since then sort of dueling protests. You know, initially there had been on the 26th, I think, Nahda tried to rally people to, to come to the parliament. They didn't seem to really succeed. There was also sort of, a, I think, maybe fears of the situation uh, escalating into perhaps more violence. Um, but then we saw very peaceful protests 
for and against the president's moves back and forth on several weekends, which people were sort of arguing about the numbers, you know, how many actually came out for the president's side, how many came out against the president. You know, it's hard to sort of gauge those accurately or to really have a sense of how much those are reflecting the will of the Tunisian people. I think one interesting thing we can look at is, is perhaps some polling. I think, you know, even polling is also maybe a difficult way to, to sort of assess the mood since things are changing so quickly. But in the Zogby polling that was recently done, in which the Middle East Institute had, had a, I think, a really good panel on, you know, only 30% of respondents said that they wanted the current political system, the mixed prime ministry uh, presidential system as it is now. And a slight majority, 52%, disapproved of restoring parliament as, as it used to be. More telling, I think, is that there was 84% of people who said they want the electoral law and the constitution amended in early elections, which in a way is, is saying that there's broad support for what the, the president wants to do in terms of his shaping of the uh, political system. Uh, that there really is widespread agreement that the, the political system is flawed as it stands. And so the popularity of the July 25th moves comes you know, I think in many ways from anger at the previous government, but also people who are fed up with the political system as it's set up and uh, what they see as corruption, all three of which President Kai Said has, has made a focus of his so far, but we still don't know what that means in terms of practical policy. Great. Both of you bring up, you know, a, a really important point, which I want to talk about next, which is the question of legitimacy. And you're explaining, Fadl, that maybe there is a little bit sort of more legitimacy on the street for Qais Saeed and for what the new government would do. But this new government was not approved by parliament. This government also sort of essentially accepts the new framework within which they will be operating, which is Qais Saeed's rule by decree. So Lilia, what sort of legitimacy does this government have? And what does that mean for all of Tunisia's sort of, you know, myriad issues and the actions that are urgently needed? to deal with the economic crisis and the kind of growing divide also within society that we've been um, hearing both of you talk about. So yeah, just before answering your question, I want to rectify something. It's, I wouldn't say it's a big divide in the society. Until now, the opposition to K. Sayed or the support towards K. Sayed in the protests uh, Fadil talked about are very political. We can't talk about spontaneous protests from both sides. And we can't talk as well of protests from, I would say, popular neighborhoods uh, like we had earlier January because of poverty and the lack of employment. So for now, the battle is still kind of political. You don't have like this massive number of people just going out in the streets for one or another side. You had those masses just after the 25th of, 25th of July, but for now it's sort of quiet. So I would say there is a polarized debate, but it's more on social media, in the media, in the mainstream media, and in the maybe intellectual world, rather than in the streets where you feel like there is still sort of they are still trying to give a chance to K. Sayed, most of people, from what I hear in the streets from ordinary people, such as, you know, fruit and vegetable sellers to people in the regions waiting uh, action on the economical side. And I think this actually answers partly your question. There is really a matter of time in all this, because this kind of momentum that Tunisia is living and this kind of break that Kay Sayed has with the opinion, he's not the target, you know, of popular discontent like former governments were, is kind of temporary. We know and we have seen in Tunisia that the popular opinion can really turn their back against any political person if they are not held accountable or if they don't deliver what they promised. And I think that's one of the main things that we gain with the revolution is that people really comprehend politics as, you know, you need to deliver. And this is the, the main issue of the new government. On paper, it's a government with a lot of academics, people close to Kaysay et entourage, and at the same time, who are quite well known in their domain to be competent and they are far from politics or the uh, parties 
which can be seen as good because it's synonym in Tunisia right now as being cleaned in a way which means not corrupted. But at the same time, this government is one of the government that has the less powers since the revolution. It has no leverage. According to the presidential decree that was published on the 22nd of September, K. Sayed basically is ruling everything the government does. He's presiding the minister's council. He's also deciding the general politics of the country. And the prime minister and the government is just following through. So that's on paper. We still don't know, I mean, what form it, it's going to take and what shape, you know, the government is going to have. But it kind of really questions how much power the government will have. And also for now, I mean, the new prime minister, she hasn't really presented a roadmap. She repeated that her priorities were the economy, the fight against corruption, but we already have heard that with K. Sayed since he took power. So I think now, and there is a general call for that, we really need a sort of deadlines, roadmap, you know, reforms announcement. And there is a lot of pressures for this because in Tunisia, it's well known that by the end of December and the beginning of January, people start to protest. It has historically, it has always been a very difficult month, the month of January. And so that's why for now, I would say that the debate is still political, but it could be very social, could become very social by the end of the year. And then it's very difficult because if the government doesn't deliver something, people will be more easily you know, convinced that it's, again, another failure. Okay, so Fadl, let's talk details here about what uh, Lilia mentioned in terms of the lack of a roadmap. Is there anything that you can glean from recent appointments, you know, messaging from either the president or the government about what their priorities will be for the next phase? Yeah, I mean, and, and if I can just go back to a couple of things Lydia mentioned on, on the question of legitimacy, um, you know, speaking about the government, what it's going to be doing. You know, I do think that the protests, as, as much as, as they are, perhaps, as Lydia said, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good point to consider that these are not maybe necessarily reflective of broad swaths of the society. But it was a test, I think, to see whether they would be allowed. I mean, I think there are some people who were genuinely concerned that, you know, the rights of assembly, the right of protest, that these are now perhaps under greater threat than they had been in the past. So it was a test that was passed in a sense. And, and I think that's, that's also a question of legitimacy of the president to see whether they'll allow protests and opposition in the ways that we've seen it before in Tunisia in the last uh, 10 years. The other thing that Lydia mentioned that I want to, to touch on is, is that she mentioned that the, the new government has less power than the, the previous ones, which is certainly true. The previous governments you know, under that system, um, which you know, I think uh, my side has, has basically de facto scrapped that system, the most powerful position was the prime minister, according to the constitution or the, the head of government. It was unelected with really no popular constituency. And that was only there as a product of a parliamentary consensus between opposing groups meaning that there was horse trading for a head of government, which makes them, in a sense, more removed from popular will and accountability. And I think that was a trend that we saw over the years with uh, several prime ministers. And with the government of uh, Prime Minister uh, Hashem Mishishi, we saw, I think, that was reach a new level of disconnect, you know, far beyond governments we've seen in terms of uh, their disconnection from, from any really real popular constituency. So perhaps, I mean, perhaps the constitution authors had in mind that this would be sort of multiple layers of distance from perhaps more direct democracy and, and elections, and that this would maybe be a stop on, on what they could say maybe is so-called populism. But if that was the case, if that was the intention, I think that, in a sense, it has backfired, something that Kai Said has, has really uh, made his main focus and, uh, you know, pointing to his own uh, presidential elections as, as really the source of legitimacy, being more valid than perhaps Prime Minister Him Shishé Mishishi, who he dismissed. So just to go back to your other question about, you know, what will this new government, you know, regardless of legitimacy, what issues it's going to have to deal with? I mean, there's the pressing budget issues, really, that I think are first and foremost, a, a new budget, funding for public debt. There's the issue of ratings agencies who have been decreasing Tunisia's sovereign bond ratings. These are all short-term issues that I think will need immediate attention. 
So far, we've seen one report from central bank official in Tunisia saying that they will get some sort of financial assistance from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. We know that strings have come attached in the past from the IMF and World Bank assistance, which which came with U.S. and European bilateral assistance that was really much really tied to it. These strings were really in the economic sphere. If I had to speculate, I think that you know perhaps there may be strings that come with Saudi and UAE funding that might be more political rather than economic strings. Both countries are strongly anti-Anasa party, uh, so perhaps they are looking for something, for some means of excluding Anasa from future political scene, one way or another. But it's too early to tell. This is just speculation at this point. But as for for this government, I mean, we really haven't seen Prime Minister uh, Boudin, let alone her ministers, really make their mark. In the past, we've seen every prime minister has taken quite a bit of time to carve out independence from the president that appointed them or that nominated them. Um, and this time, I think maybe even more difficult or maybe take longer than that, if at all, for this government or this prime minister and to, to carve out some independence from the president. And given that she's really operating at the president's whim under what is what is a totally new system rewritten by the president, according to his decree on September 22nd. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that's really problematic. And I want to follow up on a point that you said about how prime ministers had kind of in the past been insulated a little bit from accountability. But my question to you is, isn't that what elections are for, though, Fadl? I mean, prime ministers are appointed following the results of elections and so forth. So how is how is there going to be accountability moving forward for this new prime minister and for this president other than through the streets? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, the the problem was that there was so many prime ministers were not political prime ministers that we've seen in the last 10 years. A lot of them were sort of these compromise between Anahda and whichever party came in second or first in the case of Anida Tunis before that. And you had basically this setup of a, these were, you know, to very, very simplify it, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the analyses were simplified, the Islamists on one side and sort of a secular grouping on the other side, you know, when it came to the 2019 elections with uh, Qalb Tunis under Nabil Karwi, you know, that was sort of a, a shadow of the Nida Tunis coalition. But in both cases, these two blocks that really define themselves in contradiction to each other ended up governing together. And so, you know, as part of this real sense that, you know, to, to maintain stability in Tunisia, there needed to be a consensus between these two groups, meaning that there wasn't really any contentious politics. Contentious politics weren't happening at the level of parliament. They were happening on the streets anyways. I mean, we, that's where we saw a lot of the, the sort of contention or opposition, or we would see it in the role of the UGT today. So I think that's going to continue. We're seeing it already a bit now uh, with uh, UGT today. We're seeing other unions, whether it's lawyers unions, judges unions, the journalists union. I think all of these four are very important. The quartet seems to be taking a, a renewed importance. The quartet would being the, um, the four civil society groups that won the Nobel Prize for sort of steering Tunisia out of the crisis that it had in 2013, when some people were saying that maybe Tunisia was facing an Egypt-style scenario. And they've, they've regained an importance, or at least they're trying to regain an importance, because these are institutions that not only have a long history and an ability to mobilize people, um, whether that's through their members with the day or whether it's you know an entire class of society with lawyers and judges, or through the media, those groups are going to play an important role in this current moment as a de facto check, or at least try to play a check on the president's powers. So I guess then the question after this is, do you see that there is going to be a national dialogue? This is something that we heard from the Elysee, the French presidential palace, uh, following President Macron's call with Qais Saeed, that Qais Saeed will or wants to hold maybe a national dialogue. I mean, he doesn't really strike me as sort of a consensus seeking or a consensus building figure. So what, what do you both think about the idea of a potential dialogue? That and also, how would that play with the process of rewriting the constitution? He said he's going to appoint a new committee to draft a new constitution. You know, what can we expect in that regard? Fadli, you have done some interviews on this. You have some insights, having talked to Qais Saeed's students and sort of his various pronouncements in the run-up to the presidential election in 2019. You know, what are your thoughts on what he has in mind on constitution uh, drafting and Lilia, 
What are your thoughts on a potential national dialogue? Sure, yeah. You mentioned um, we had talked to Kai Saeed's former students. I've also had a couple of occasions to, to interview Kai Saeed over the years. And at every point of crisis in the last few years, I think observers, politicians have had different assessments on the root causes of why Tunisia is in the crisis it's in, whether it's economic or political, but sort of continuing crisis since 2011. I think some people would say, you know, the, the root crisis is political Islam or represented by Anahta, or some people would say it's capitalism or neocolonialism. Some people would say it's the unions and the UJJTE. Some would say it's cronyism and or old regime figures. But I, I can say that Haisaid has consistently seen the political system and the electoral law as the root issue of Tunisia's crises. He sees party lists as favoring party leaders with centralized control. He sees parties as using clientelism or some form of corruption to get and stay in power. He sees the political system as overly centralized in the capital Tunis and that it actually needs to be sort of decentralized, needing legitimacy from the local level governance in a sort of a bottom-up approach. So he's been extremely consistent about these since 2011. Um, you know, he's given quite a lot of media interviews he hasn't given quite a lot of details on this project. He's not really detail-oriented in his uh, media pronouncements on this, on how it could be maybe implemented. But he does have the chance now to sort of put these theories into practice. But getting them done is easier said than done. Uh, you know, one man can't rule alone, and no one has ever, ever really ruled Tunisia alone. You know, in dictatorship as in the sense of one man dictates and it becomes policy. Um, you know, even under Bourguiba and Ben Ali, they had to deal with members of the RCD party, businessmen with landowners, with aristocratic elites, you know, different constituents of Tunisian society. So there's always been, you know, other parts of society, you know, certainly now the UGT, student unions, lawyers, judges who have carved out varying degrees of independence over the years, and particularly since 2011 in this new democratic environment, I think all of these groups have used their muscles in, in ways that I think make them even stronger actors than they were under the Ben Ali and Bourguiba regime. Uh, Lilia? Yes, and I think what is interesting also is that Kay Sayed talked about national dialogue, but at the same time, he also said before he took power on the 25th that he rejected the idea of national dialogue led by the quartet in 2013 and 14. And he said that it was not a national dialogue. So in a way, he rejects the intermediary bodies, such as the unions for workers, but also for bosses. And also, the, at the time, there was also several associations, such as the Tunisian League of Human Rights and all those intermediary bodies, which are very important in Tunisia because they have always been there in a way. And so it's, um, I mean, even if he switched gears a bit after the 25th, for instance, he met a lot of representatives from Utica, which is the unions of companies, he didn't meet, for instance, with the leader of UGTT. And for me, it's still a sort of sign that he's not really ready to implement national dialogue as it was made before. And he, he said himself that he didn't want to go backwards. So, and there is also another dialogue that he wants to launch when, and we don't have a lot of information on this as well, is a dialogue with the youth in the regions, which is one of his main priorities as well, is sort of to reconnect with the youth in the regions. He went to see them during the elections. He, he spent almost 10 years, you know, uh, going to regions every year to talk to these youth. And he wants to sort of kind of submit his political project to them and maybe encourage them to talk about it as well. So we don't know. I mean, it's it's a whole new idea about democracy. You know, we, we must not forget that his main goal is to implement his political project, which is a very complicated system of democracy, which is not really representative, which is not really by the people, like it's it's a mix of them. It's basically presidential regime with an elected council of councillors who have been elected by the people in different steps. 
And there is also an inspiration with the recall system, like in the US. So it's, it's kind of very, very complicated. And I think now what I understood from what he said is that he wants to talk with the youth about, you know, the nature of the regime they would like and if this idea could, you know, be somewhat accepted. And he seems to be more focused on this dialogue than the dialogue with the intermediary bodies, which he will have to have at some point, because if he's not backed by them, he will lose a lot of credibility and he will be more and more isolated. Yeah, thanks, Lilia. That's it's a complicated system, but you've you you sort of articulated it very well and kind of I think given a very good sense of maybe what his political aspiration is like. Look, I want to close this conversation by talking about the role of international actors. We talked a little bit about you know potential funding from Gulf uh, partners. Father, you mentioned we talked a little bit about how you know international debate. Um, about Tunisia sort of impacts what's going on inside Tunisia. But I want to hear from each one of you very clearly about what you, you know, what do you think Tunisians want to see by way of external support? We'll start with you, uh, Fadl. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the U.S. could do and what Tunisians would want to see the U.S. do. Yeah, I mean, I think there there is a very strong streak now that we've seen amongst not only the president, but, um, you know, different groups from the journalists union to the UGT, um, really against foreign intervention, even at the level of Congress assessing Tunisia's domestic situation. So I think the, the it's, it's a very sensitive issue in Tunisia when you're looking at the Tunisian perspective on this. You know, I think that there that doesn't mean that there isn't things that the U.S. can do in this moment. I think, you know, one of them that probably would be quite popular here, actually, would be maybe working towards canceling Tunisia's public debts. I mean, given the fact that Tunisia is facing such a crisis with short term financing issues and some of this being accumulated from the Ben Ali era, I think this could also give Tunisia some space for economic policy making that suits Tunisia's needs, that's tailored to Tunisia's needs. Let me ask you a quick question about how could that be done without it being politically seen as condoning Qaisaid's anti-democratic action? Well, there may be a timing issue of working towards cutting Tunisia's debt if the U.S. doesn't want to look like it is in full support of Saeed's July 25th moves. But Tunisia's current debt crisis is one that has been brewing for years, with it reaching a real breaking point this year in terms of debt repayments due. And that was never addressed in 2011. Tunisia's financial obligations and strictures were not assessed. There was no debt audit. There was no urgency behind finding a better structure for Tunisia's economy so that it could stand on its own without seeking more and more loans other than some assistance for entrepreneurship and privatization, which really nibbled at the edge of the problem. At the same time, if people are seriously concerned about Tunisia's democracy, finding an alternative to more IMF loans or financing from Gulf countries needs to be a priority. I think there was just an appointment in the foreign ministry for someone to negotiate directly with the IMF and the World Bank. Do you know anything about that appointment? I don't. I saw the appointment, but I don't know details of the person's background. It seems that they they have uh, you know credentials from you know academic credentials, but in terms of work experience, I did see some people sort of questioning whether they have enough work experience for such a delicate task. On what the what the U.S. should do, I think that. Just the Emne Galeli of Amnesty International um, had said in her testimony um, for the, the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, on Tunisia that the U.S. could focus on transitional justice, continuing the work of the Truth and Dignity Commission. And I think that's, that's something else where the U.S. could maybe look at, particularly when it comes to the Ben Ali regime and sort of, you know, trying to sort of get over some of the, the issues from there. But uh, just, just to switch from what the U.S. should do to maybe just what it is likely to do, because I think those are two different questions. You know, I, I think that there's been a few calls, at least in, in, in Europe and, and, and a little bit in the U.S., to sort of a return to parliament. I think it's probably likely that both the U.S. and European actors will probably back, back, back down on that if they see that, you know, perhaps there's elections in, in the offing. I think also we're seeing that you know, military funding to Tunisia, there's there's now a Senate bill that says that military funding needs to be conditioned on a review by the State Department on the role of the military, on its role in rolling back democracy. So I think there's this new element of scrutiny on Tunisia 
But as we saw in the congressional hearings, there there are divisions between those who are, I think, happy with uh, Syed getting rid of and the Anahda party from the political scene, seeing it as an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, versus those who support Anahda for its you know supposed effectiveness in the counter terror fight. So I think those those two divisions within the sort of the, the U.S. approach that we saw during the the, the House hearing. I think we'll prevent a clear move against Syed at the moment to sort of try and have a, a tougher stance on him, combined with the fact that Syed has, has remained, I think, largely ideologically ambiguous. So if he were to take, if he were to change, if we saw that there was a clear ideological a project, if he were taking to take bold steps to realign Tunisia away from the West or from, from NATO or to maybe move towards a stronger nationalist position economically, I think that's when we'll see that those divisions on Syed's moves on July 25th will maybe disappear and that there might be you know, more of an appetite to take a more confrontational attitude with President Syed. Lilia, what are your thoughts on what the EU can do and your sense of what Tunisians would like to see the EU do? I think it's uh, very complicated because uh, as as Fadil said, like there is really a, a general call for a return to dialogue. It's the subject actually of the uh, plenary session at the European Parliament today, which is on Tunisia. And there has been a lot of calls also from the high representative of the European Union for foreign affairs, uh, Joseph Borrell to sort of restore maybe uh, the parliament or at least to find a solution to the fate of the parliament because we didn't talk about this, but the situation of the parliament in Tunisia is kind of very unclear. You have a frozen parliament, uh, members of parliaments who don't have any salaries right now, and uh, some of them who were uh, in uh, liberal uh, jobs before, such as, you know, lawyers or consultants or, you know, leading a firm, they, they, they were able to go back to their jobs. But uh, members of parliament who used to be civil servants or work into public institutions, they can't work because on paper, there are still members of parliament. So they either have to resign, which is unclear how, because who would they present their resignation to? Because there is no parliament, once again. Or the parliament has to be dissolved once and for all. And that's very tricky for K. Sayed because it would imply, if he decides to respect the constitution, that if he dissolves the parliament, he has to reorganize very quickly Uh, new legislative elections. And I don't think it's uh, in the books for him right now. Like he's more focused on, you know, changing the regime and maybe going to towards a referendum. So I think it's uh, it's a concern for the European Union and for other countries. You know, how can you leave uh, such a situation like this? And also there is another concern about the lack of counter power. You have in the presidential decree a sentence that said, you know, all the measures taken by the president have uh, can can't be countered by any uh, recourse or resort. So it's what is concerning is that, of course, you know, there was a general dissatisfaction with the parliament, with the, some of the institutions, but the fact that no one can act on what the president is doing is very worrying for uh, foreign countries. And also, it's, it's, it's kind of worrying as well for democracy in Tunisia, because as Fadil said earlier, it was a test to see if protests were still allowed when they were happening, and they are still allowed. And uh, K. Sayed promised to not touch freedoms and uh, rights. But if he decides to touch them, or if, if he decides otherwise, no one can really do something about it. And uh, I think that's the main concern for now. And I also saw a lot of foreign countries asking for a roadmap and a deadline because K. Sayed is saying that this situation is exceptional and temporary, but he didn't put a deadline to it. Yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a dark note to end on, but this is all we have the time for today. Thank you so much to our guests, Fadl and Lilia. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you to our listeners for joining us for today's episode. And special thanks to our podcast editor, Meredith McCleary, 
and MEI's entire communications team. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Ntisar, and uh, the whole team. Thank you. Thanks for the conversation. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.